Good morning. What you're about to hear is one truly extraordinary piece of music, one of Bach's very earliest surviving works, written when he was only 22, BWV 106, better known as the Actus Tragicus. It's one of my most favourite pieces. And for a moment, let's just forget that Bach ever went to Leipzig, that he ever became Thomas Cantor and stayed there for 27 years, and all the great music that he composed there, the St. John, the St. Matthew Passion, and two thirds of his church cantatas. Because on the basis of this one work alone, he deserves recognition as one, if not the greatest of all composers of religious music. Right, so what do we know about this piece and what makes it so special? Well, to start with, there's no autograph score and it wasn't discovered until 16 years after his death and then in a copied score but it was the first of his cantatas to be published as part of Bach's complete works edition in 1867. And from its text, it's clear that this is no regular Sunday or festive cantata like all the others that we've been posting each Sunday since Easter. It was written for a funeral, but we don't know whose. And like so many of his works on the subject of death, it's never morbid or saccharine. On the contrary, it's serene and basically optimistic. Uh, Bach himself knew a thing or two about death, having lost both his parents before his 10th birthday, and he was forced to dig deep and become self-reliant. And above all, this music is consoling. Ask anyone who's been in need of solace when coping with grief, doesn't matter if they're Christian or agnostic or even atheist, if they've somehow turned to or been directed to Bach and heard a piece like the Actus Tragicus, the chances are they've found inspiration and comfort. And the thing is that although this piece is crammed with complex, challenging Lutheran theology, it's written by a very human human being, and the music reveals chinks in his armour plating through which we can glimpse the vulnerability of a regular person's struggles with a regular person's doubts and fears. Right from the start, Bach draws us into a world of magical sounds one so different from all his other cantatas due to its soft grain scoring, just two alto recorders and two viola da gambas and continuo. The opening sonatina consists of 20 of the most heart-stopping bars in all of Bach's works. The yearning dissonances he gives to the gambas right at the start, the ravishing way the two recorders entwine, slipping in and out of unison and swapping adjacent notes. It's a technique known as battement literally beating against each other. And there's nothing quite like this in any other 18th century music I've ever come across, though it's a device used quite often in contemporary music. And then the fun begins. And the cantata is arranged symmetrically in two parts. Then the first one centers mainly on Old Testament quotations, four short interlocking movements stressing the need to prepare for death. It's God who sets the clock, so set your house in order and observe the law and the covenant, because, man, you'll have to die. The second part is a bit less severe and centres on the New Testament. I place my soul in your hands, Lord, for you have redeemed me. To which Jesus replies, as he did to the thief crucified next to him, today you will be with me in paradise. And this is followed by Simeon's song, the Nunc Dimittis, with peace and joy I now depart. Death is but a sleep to me. Perhaps the easiest way to grasp the overall structure of this cantata is to picture it as an inverted isosceles triangle or an upside down pyramid. In this way, part one begins on the top left diagonal, moving downwards to the actual moment of death. And Bach marks this with silence, an empty bar with a fermata over it. And then comes the gradual ascent up the right-hand diagonal with its comforting New Testament message that death is just a sleep. I find the most touching moment in this cantata is when the music bottoms out at the end of part one, just before that silent bar, which is so mysterious. Up to then, the three lower voices have been hammering out the ancient law and covenant in a fugue, while the solo soprano above them has all the while been making impassioned pleas to Jesus to come and save her. But gradually the fugue peters out and the instruments playing the chorale tune drop out one by one, leaving the soprano alone and unsupported, her voice trailing away in a fragile arabesque, a bit like a butterfly. 
utterly magical. We performed this work in a concert on the island of Iona in the Scottish Hebrides on the 28th of July 2000 on exactly Bach's death day. It was an unforgettable experience. His music mingling with the bleats of grazing sheep and lambs on the island and the mewing of seagulls over the stretch of water that separates Iona from Mull. And what you're about to hear is the second of our two recordings of the Actus Tragicus, this one made in 2013. And you'll find it on our website along with his Easter oratorio. <laughs> 